Hello everyone and welcome back to Gurong Pinoy Social Science Majorship Review. Question number 11. Which refers to the act of the president to stay the execution of a convict? A. Pardon, B. Reprieve, C. Amnesty, and D. Commutation. Looking at the question statement, okay, the most important part here is stay the execution of a convict. What do you mean by stay the execution? This means that the president will postpone the execution of a person who has been convicted of a crime. Now let's check the correct answer. The correct answer is B, reprieve. Why is B the correct answer? Let's look at the definitions of these terms. Pardon means the convict is allowed to get out of prison without extinguishing his offenses. So a convict is still a convict and still has committed a crime even if he is outside prison uh, already. And the moment that he commits another crime while out of prison, he will definitely be back in prison forever. So that's pardon. Number two, amnesty is allowing a political prisoner to get out free and the offenses are forgiven. So usually the amnesty is given only to political prisoners, okay? Um, because they did not actually hurt um, specific people or kill them, okay? And uh, when an amnesty is given, uh, complete freedom is given to the person. Uh, when the person is given an amnesty, it's as if, uh, it's as if that person has not committed the political crime at all, okay? Le number three, commutation is shortening the sentence served by a convicted person. Um, say instead of 70 years, according to the court, the person is going to, say, to serve 70 years of imprisonment, but the president has decided to commute the sentence and will only allow the uh, convict to stay for seven years inside prison. And number four, reprieve means canceling or postponing the punishment such as death sentence. So number uh, reprieve is the correct answer. Number 12, during the Spanish era, who was the revolutionary, revolutionary leader who waged a long war against the government because it did not allow people a proper burial for his brother? Okay, so we are looking for a person who is known in history for um, waging a long war against the government, the Spanish government. Was it A, Diego Silang, B, Andres Bonifacio, C, Francisco de Gohoy, and D, Macario Sakai? Let's check the correct answer. The correct answer is letter C, Francisco de Gohoy. The de Gohoy revolt took place in the island of Bohol from 1744 to 1829, roughly 85 years. So that was really, really wrong, uh, long. Okay. Diego Silang, on the other hand, is known to have allied with the British to overthrow the Spaniards, but he is more popularly known in the history books as being appointed governor of Ilocos on behalf of the British. When he Allied with the British, the British rewarded him by making him governor of Ilocos while the British had control of the Philippine archipelago. And Macario Sakai continued guerrilla um, raids after the Philippine-American War was over and he became president of the Tagalog Republic. Okay, so Macario Sakai is known in uh, history books as someone who... Uh, uh, even if the Philippine American war, the American war was done, still continued the the war and became president of the Tagalog Republic. Number thirteen, what was the first book published in the Philippines? Okay, so it's a written book published on paper. Is it A. Pasyong Mahal, B. Uh, Bariam Josaphat, C. Doctrina Cristiana, and D. Del Superior? Gobierno. What's the correct answer? Let's check. So it's Doctrina Cristiana. Okay. The Doctrina Cristiana was a book on the Catholic Catechism written in 1593 by Fray Juan de Plasencia. It was published both in Chinese and in 
Tagalog and it was the first book to be ever published or printed in the Philippines as early as the 16th century. Okay, number 14. Which is the overriding aim of the constitutional mandate on social justice? A, to work for social equality. B, to bridge the gap between the rich and the poor. C, to protect the squatter in the possession of the premises occupied by him because he is poor. And D, to authorize the taking of what is in excess of one's personal needs and giving it to another. Okay. So think of your answer to this question. Which of these four choices actually um, is the correct answer or the most acceptable answer? Let's, let's check. The correct answer is to bridge the gap between the rich and the poor. And why is this the correct answer? Okay. Social justice as a concept recognizes that there is widespread inequality in society, that there are rich people and poor people. However, it does not envision to make all members of society equal to each other in all respects. People in society can never be equal because they are inherently not the same. Rather, social justice guarantees equal opportunity and equal protection to all members in society. Even if there are physical differences in these people, there are differences in their levels of intellect, there are differences in their health status. At the very least, social justice guarantees that these people have equal opportunity and equal protection under law as long as they share membership in society. So the the goal here of social justice is to bridge the gap between the rich and the poor, okay? Not necessarily to make them equal, but rather just to bridge the gap by giving both the rich and the poor equal opportunity and equal protection. Number 15, Filipino citizens have the power to participate in the establishment or administration of government such as right to vote and be voted upon as an exercise of A, civil rights, B, social rights, C, economic rights, and D, political rights. Let's check the correct answer to this question. Okay, so it's D, political rights. Civil rights guarantee equal opportunities and protection under the law for everyone. So whether you are a straight person or you are a gay person, uh, you are given equal opportunity and protection. Whether you are a man or a woman, whether you're educated or uneducated, whether you are a person with disability or a normally functioning individual, okay, you are given equal opportunities and protection. That constitutes your civil rights. Social rights, on the other hand, guarantee good uh, standards of living, okay? The, uh, it guarantees that every member of society has a means of living decently, okay? So that they have good housing, for example, or they are not deprived of the ability to socialize with other people. They are given the right to, to travel. These are social rights. Economic rights, on the other hand, guarantee uh, freedom to participate in economic activities and to achieve self-sustenance. So part of economic, economic rights is uh, your right to sell products and your right to buy products as well as to achieve self-sustenance, to earn enough money to be able to sustain yourself in terms of ensuring that you have food to eat you have a house to live in, etc. So that's economic rights. And four, political rights guarantee freedom to participate in political activities and the affairs of government. And voting during elections is one of them. So political rights is the correct answer. Number 16, who does the canvassing of votes for president and vice president in every election? A, Senate and Congress, B, Supreme Court and Congress, C, Comelec and Chief Justice, and D, Joint Committee of Congress. So looking at our constitution, of course, we would generally know that the Commission on Election is that instrumentality of 
the state that is in charge of facilitating um, electoral procedures and activities. Okay, but is it the case in terms of canvassing of votes for president and vice president? Is the COMELEC the one responsible for canvassing the votes for president and vice president? Let's check. So apparently it's not. The body that canvasses votes for president and vice president is a joint committee of Congress. What does this mean? Okay. So, so we, we of course know that there are about 24 members of the Senate and more than 200 uh, members of the House of Representatives. Not all of them sit together in order to canvass the votes for the uh, president and vice president. Rather, only selected members of uh, both chambers, the Senate and the House of Representatives, form a joint committee to canvass votes for the two highest political positions in the country. Okay, let's move on. Number 17. Trade-offs are required because wants are unlimited and resource is A, marginal, B, scarce, C, unlimited, and D, economical. So, looking at the question statement, the most important thing here is trade-offs, meaning we have to sacrifice. We cannot always get what we want. Okay, and that the reason for that is because resource has a particular characteristic. Okay. The most basic idea that we learn from economics is that resource is scarce. Okay, they get depleted. Okay, um, so for example, uh, materials. Uh, if you cut all the trees in the forest, it will be very difficult to to replace all these trees um, immediately. That's why we say that resource is scarce. Imagine if everyone in the world wanted to build a house um, for, for him or herself, then we will practically be uh, depleting all the resources in the world. We will be cutting all the trees. We will be uh, mining all the minerals and uh, taking all the rocks and the stones to build our houses. And in the future, there will be nothing left. So this whole idea of scarcity refers to the basic economic problem, the gap between limited, that is scarce resources, and theoretically limitless ones. That is the nature of uh, of wants. No, we as humans, we cannot, we can want anything. We can want everything. However, we cannot have everything because resources are scarce they are limited okay and this causes an economic problem we have to make choices okay we have to do trade offs okay in order to deal with this reality so that is scarcity number 18 uh, the gross domestic product is the sum of the marked value of the a manufactured goods B, intermediate goods, C, inter inferior goods and services, and D, final goods and services. So we need to look at the definition of gross domestic product in order to answer this question. And um, after that, we will know that the correct answer is letter D, final goods and services. Okay, because by definition, gross domestic product or GDP is the total monetary or market value of all the finished goods and services produced within a country's border, borders in a specific time period. So finished goods and services only. So those goods or services, those goods that have not yet been created uh, this year and those services that have yet to be provided in the future are not part of the gross domestic product, only the finished ones, okay? Number 19, the Japanese uh, successful invasion was climaxed by the surrender of the joint Filipino-American forces on May 6, 1942. Where did this happen? Did it happen in Manila, B. Capas, Interlac, C. Corregidor, and D. Bataan? Okay, so on May 6, 1942, Filipino and American soldiers 
surrendered to the Japanese, okay? Which meant that the uh, Japanese have successfully invaded the Philippines at that time. So where did this happen? This happened in Corregidor, okay? Corregidor had been surrendered to the Japanese on May 6, 1942, marking the fall of the Philippines. It was recaptured by U.S. troops in 1945, three years later after the end of the Second World War. So in 1942, invasion of the Philippines by the Japanese was completed when the Filipinos and the Americans surrendered in Corregidor because the, it was the only part of the Philippines that was left un invaded by the Japanese until 1942. Number 20. Foreign investors are discouraged in doing business in our country. To what conditions can this be attributed? 1. Deteriorating peace and order. 2. Poor technology. Uh, 3. High tariffs. And 4. Um, poor standards. Okay, so looking at these choices, which of these choices actually discouraged foreign investors to do business in our country, in the Philippines? Let's check the correct answer. And the correct answer is letter B, 1 and 2 only. So 3 and 4 do not discourage. Why? Because the Philippines is a member of the World Trade Organization. And as part of our membership in that organization, we have agreed to eliminate trade barriers such as tariffs. Because of globalization, we wanted to promote the free movement of goods and services in different parts of the world. So high tariffs cannot be the reason why foreign investors would be discouraged to do business in the Philippines. Secondly, Filipinos are highly, highly skilled and educated, therefore have high standards of work. So we cannot necessarily say that it is because of the poor standards of work in the Philippines that foreign investors are discouraged to do business in the country. Next, 21. What is considered the earliest form of writing in the Philippines? A. Roman alphabet, B. Alibata, C. Balitao, and D. Abacada. Let's check the correct answer. The correct answer is Alibata. Okay, let's see why. Okay, by Bayin, incorrectly called Alibata is a pre-Hispanic Philippine script. It is an alpha syllabary belonging to the family of the Brahmic script. Okay, so the earliest form of writing in the Philippines is actually called by Bayin. Okay, but in the past, in the book, entitled Philippine History by Gregorio Zaide, he called it Alibata. Although in modern terms, scholars no longer think that Alibata is the correct um, uh, term because Alibata would suggest that the, the Philippine script is uh, derived from the Arabic script, okay, from the term Alifata which means the uh, Arabic um, alphabet. Uh, however, doing research about the Philippine script or form of writing, we have determined that it's actually from the family of Brahmic scripts. So therefore, we prefer to call it by Bayin. But since by Bayin is not in the choices, we will choose letter B, Alibata, as the most correct answer. Number 22. Who was among the last Filipino generals who fought the Americans and established the so-called Tagalog Republic? Is it A. Manuel Tino, B. Macario Sakay, C. Miguel Malvar, and D. Gregorio del Pilar? So looking at these four choices, we already know that these four were Filipino generals during the um, revolutionary period. But we are looking for someone who fought the Americans and established the Tagalog Republic. So who was that person? That was Macario Sakai. Letter B is the correct answer. Okay. So Macario Sakai was a Filipino general who took part in the Philippine-American War. After the war, he became president of the Tagalog Republic. That's why Macario Sakai is the correct answer. 
Manuel Pino, on the other hand, was one of the three fathers of the city of Nueva Ecija. So that's, that's what Manuel Pino is um, known for. Gregorio del Pilar was also a gen Filipino general known as the boy general for being one of the youngest generals in the Revolutionary Army. That's how we know him in the history books. And Miguel Malvar assumed command of the Philippine Revolutionary Forces after Emilio Aguinaldo was captured by the Americans in 1901. Okay, let's move on. Number 23. What building was the only one left intact after the destruction of Intramuros during the Battle of Manila? So we are looking here for a church that was located inside the walled city of Intramur Intramuros in Manila that was not uh destroyed during the battle of manila was it a san agustin church b the manila cathedral c Quiapo church and d manila post office so looking at these um choices we will already eliminate letter c Quiapo church because it is not found within the walled city of intramuros so the correct answer should be letter a san agustin church okay the San Agustin Church is located inside the historic walled city of Intramuros in Manila and it was completed in 1607 and it is now known as the old, oldest stone church in the country. Um, during the Japanese occupation of World War II, San Agustin Church became a concentration camp. Uh, so the Japanese stayed there. In the final days of the Battle of Manila, hundreds of Intramuros residents and clergy were held hostage in the church by Japanese soldiers with many hostages killed during the three-week-long battle. It was the only one among the seven churches of Intramuros to survive a leveling by combined American and Filipino ground forces in May 1945. So the Battle of Manila was fought between the Japanese and the combination of Americans and Filipinos. And because of this battle, many edifices or buildings or structures structures within uh, intramuros were destroyed and san agustin church was only well, the only one left of the seven churches there number 24 what characteristics of government is established by the 1987 constitution number one parliamentary system of government number two presidential system of government with three branches Number three, the three branches of government have a check and balance over one another. And number four, the three branches of government are separate and independent of one another. So which of these, okay, is correct? Let's check. Okay, the correct answer is letter C, two, three, and four. One is not the correct answer. Parliamentary system of government uh, is not the correct answer. The 1987 constitution did not establish a parliamentary system of government. Rather, the 1987 constitution provides that we have three branches of government that are separate and co-equal. These are the executive department, the legislative department, and the judicial department. The president heads the executive branch, and this makes it a presidential system. A parliamentary system, on the other hand, is headed by a prime minister who is a member of the legislature. In effect, there is a fusion of executive and legislative power in this system. The 1987 constitution does not provide for a prime minister in our country, and so therefore we are not a parliamentary system. Next item, number 25. With the uh, Batasang Pambansa performing legislative and executive powers in the Marcos regime, which form of government was implemented? A. Presidential, B. Monarchical, C. Parliamentary, and D. Dictatorial. So in the previous item, we learned that the 1987 Constitution has created a presidential system of government in the country. But this has not always been the case. During the Marcos regime, there was another um, form of government implemented. Let's check which of these is true. So looking at A, B, C, and D, we will already eliminate letter B, monarchical. There was never a king for the Philippines. And so therefore, the Philippines has never been a monarchy uh, under the 
different constitutions of the Philippines, like the Malolos Constitution, the 1935 Constitution, the 1973 Constitution, the 1987, the Freedom Constitution, and the 1987 Constitution. We were never a monarchical government. So, uh, since I already said that uh, um, the 1987 Constitution uh, provides for a presidential form of government in the Philippines, but this was also this was this was not the case during the Marcos regime. We will already eliminate letter A. So let's check the correct answer. And the correct answer is letter C, parliamentary. Okay. During the Marcos regime, there was a president, and that was Marcos, and a prime minister, that was Prime Minister Virata. But the former, okay, President Marcos was more powerful than the latter, Prime Minister. Virata, okay? The president also exercised lawmaking powers through presidential decrees. And so therefore, there seems to be a fusion of powers between the executive and the legislature. Um, and therefore, this made it a parliamentary form of government. The simplest indication is that during the Marcos period, we had a prime minister, okay? So that made us a parliamentary form of government. Number 26. The Philippine legislature is divided into two major bodies, the Senate and the House of Representatives. Which among the following best describes the division of the legislative body of the country? Is it A, bicameralism, B, bipartisanism, C, co-legislative, and D, unicameralism? Okay. So looking at these choices, we will already eliminate letter D, unicameralism, because this comes from Two root words, uni and camera. Camera meaning chamber or house. Okay, and uni meaning one. So unicameralism means that the legislature only has one house. But in the Philippines, we have two houses, the House, the Senate, and the House of Representatives. So D is not the correct answer. So we are torn between A, B, and C. Let's check. A is the correct answer. It's bicameralism. Okay. Unicameralism means that the legislature has only one chamber, so that's not the correct answer. Bicameralism means that the legislature is divided into two chambers, the upper house and the lower house. So this is the correct answer because we have the upper house, which is the Senate, and the lower house, which is the House of Representatives. Bipartisanship means that opposing camps in a two-party system compromise and meet halfway in order to achieve legislative goals, okay? So that is not the correct answer as well because bipartisanship is actually um, two opposing parties uh, setting aside their differences in order to agree on something. The other choice, which is co-legislative, is a made-up word, so that is not that definitely not the correct answer. So the correct answer is bicameralism. 